people here. Uh, the Irish Mawson Museum, the Irish Riviera. I hear Mayor Curley have a couple houses here too. So I was expecting a few Irish people. So uh, thanks for coming. I think you'll enjoy this. Um, I, I became uh, interested in my Irish heritage years ago. And this is kind of what spurred this lecture. I do many other lectures. And uh, this is, I started doing genealogy back before the internet. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> and when you had to go up and uh, look at the microfilm at the, the Mormon uh, spots. And I was really frustrated because I'd go up and, I, and I'd research my family. In every census roll would say, place of origin, Ireland, 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 Ireland. And I got really frustrated. Uh, I kept saying, where are in Ireland? I want to know. So then the internet. And um, just when it came out, I put one of those messages on genealogy.com, give a little description of my family. Seven years later, somebody answered it. <laughs> uh, and I found out that my family came, my dad's family came from Bantry, County Cork. They came to St. John's from Brunswick, settled in Maine, and then made their way down here. So that's how I got interested in it. And I thought, originally I thought, oh, let's put a whole thing, the Irish in America, let's put this together. Uh, but I don't think we want to be here for two weeks. <laughs> and then I thought, just the Irish in Massachusetts. Well, we don't want to be here all night. So we got it down to the Irish in Boston, which is probably the best, because Boston was one of the major ports of entry. Uh, and they also had to deal with these people called the Puritans. And there's a lot of interesting stories that come here. So without any further ado, let's start this thing. Um, if you have a question or a comment, uh, we can hold it to the end. And if we feel like having a little Q&A, that's OK. If we don't, that's OK. You won't hurt my feelings. It's, it's kind of a long lecture, so I can understand if you want to take off. Um, let's see. How's this mic sound? Good. I usually don't use a microphone. I teach eighth grade, so I can project very well. <laughs> and it's really nice to talk to a group of people and not say shh, shh, shh every five minutes. So let's start. Hmm. Contrary to popular belief, the Irish were not the first in Boston. It was our friends, the Puritans. Now, uh, sometimes I refer back to my, my uh, public school education as a public school history teacher. I know how it's taught. Quick and memorization. And that's the way they set up. It's too bad we can't get into things more deeply. When I went to school, I learned the Puritans were people that escaped England. They were seeking religious freedom. From what? I don't know. From who? I, I, why did they call them Puritans? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, they, they were pure. Uh, this is the reason they were called Puritans. Or I should say, he is the reason. It all started with this fellow. Did you know that Henry VIII was a staunch Catholic? Yes. He was a defender of the church. Until he wanted an annulment. And the Pope wouldn't give it to him. So what he did was he, he kind of had a little hissy fit and he took over all the churches and made himself the head of the Church of England. Now, if you were to walk into the Church of England, or you could say the Anglican Church, you'd think you were in a Catholic church. The only thing different in an Anglican church was uh, you could get a divorce and uh, he was the head of it. Basically, that was it. Now. As this is all going on, as he took over the church and broke away from the Catholic Church, created his Anglican Church, there was a more theological reformation going on at the time. Martin Luther had broken away from the Catholic Church because he saw a lot of things that the Catholic Church was doing. Uh, was a little bit shady, which they, they've changed now. They've come full circle. Back, back during these times, they were more of a, a political force. Now I think they've come 360 where they're more back to just being a religious force. So Martin Luther started it all, but there were a lot of other people in Europe that felt the same way. And they wanted to break away from the Catholic Church, including this gentleman. This is John Calvin. 
And he believed, he had a theology that he believed that Christians should only do what is expressly written in the Bible. That humans should, like conclaves and popes, should not make decisions about religion. That you should go back to the basics. This is probably where we get fundamentalist, uh, fundamentalism from. And the people that followed him were the Puritans. Now, they were called the Puritans because they were members of the Anglican Church and they wanted to purify it of anything that smacked of Catholicism, popery, as they called it. They wanted to remove all the statues. They wanted to get rid of the, the vestments that were really just an echo of the Roman Empire, the, the uh, incense, the crosses, the, the uh, stations of the cross. They wanted to get rid of it all and just break it down into a very simple church. And also, they didn't believe in the top-down hierarchy. They believed in electing their own preachers. This is the Puritans. Now, if you want to see what their church looked like, this is just a hop, skip, and a jump from here. This is the ship's church over in Hull. I'm, I'm sorry, Hingham. Uh, and do you see any crosses here? No. And the, and the, the uh, preachers would probably just be dressed in stark, stark black. This is, uh, this is not a Puritan church anymore. Uh, and it is, it is really reminiscent of what they saw their religion to be. And their law that they brought over here was based on the Bible, not on man's law. And in 1630, they landed here with a fleet of 30 ships and they eventually ended up here. The Indians called it shaman. The Puritans renamed it Boston. At high tide, it was an island. This is what Boston used to look like. And this is where they were going to build their, their new Jerusalem, their shining city on the hill, an example of what Christianity should be. And if you can put yourself back in the 1630s and 40s, this is the view you would have in Boston. Imagine yourself standing in, around State Street, the State Street Bank, and facing the State House. That would be your view. That hill in the background is Beacon Hill before they cut it down. That pole is the beacon. And that's what their city looked like. And this city, as I said, would be their shining example to the world of what Christianity should be. And the law was based only on the Bible. This is the city that the first Irish came to. And they did not come here willingly. Here's another thing I learned in public school. An indentured servant, this is, this is something that I memorized, an indentured servant is somebody who wants to come to America and they find somebody already in America and they make an arrangement for that person who's in America to pay for their passage. In return, they serve them for five to seven years, and then they are released. That's indentured servitude. And hopefully you'll learn um, maybe a trade in the, in the mix, too. Uh, these people that were brought here were called indentured servants, but they were not. They were brought here against their will. And it's because of this man. Now, we've already heard about the, the Puritans. While the Puritans clashed with the royalists, the Anglican church folks, and there was a civil war, and the Puritans won the civil war. And when they took over the government, they had the king beheaded. Charles I lost his head, and this man took his place. But he didn't want to be called the king. He was the head of the Puritan army, the new model army. He was a general. Now he was the Lord protector of the Commonwealth of England, Oliver Cromwell. Now, as soon as he took power, Cromwell started hearing stories coming out of Ireland, which had been subjugated by the English going back to the 1200s. And he started to hear about these Irish rebels that were attacking their English landlords and committing these horrible, horrible atrocities, which we now know were greatly exaggerated. And Cromwell was incensed. He wanted to take his new model army and turn it on Ireland and 
make her come to her knees and that's what he did he took his new model army and the first place they landed was the walled medieval city of Drogheda. Now the mayor of Drogheda knew that Cromwell was coming and he, he really didn't think, oh, well, we've got this big city with six foot walls and they're 30 feet high, they'll never get through it. And Cromwell circled the city and he told the mayor, he said, look, you either surrender right now or there will be no quarter. That means if you don't surrender and we have to go through a hole in the wall, you're going to all die. And the mayor still said, go take a leap in so many words. <coughs> what he didn't know was that Cromwell had big siege cannon that could easily break down those walls. And it, it wasn't long before Cromwell's army blasted holes in those walls and sent his men through the breach. Now many of his men died taking the city and because of that, once they did get into the city and they subdued it, they went on a massive murder spree. 4,000 people were murdered here. This was after they took the city. He wasn't done yet. Next he aimed his army at Wexford. Now I think what happened here was the folks in Wexford knew what was coming. You see the numbers going down. And the next place he took was Waterford, 400. Now by this time, Ireland was totally and absolutely subjugated once again. And uh, he had reached his goal. But I don't think he was done yet. This is what he did. This is just part of it. Over 100,000 Irish children were ripped from the arms of their parents and taken to the Americas, not just New England, as quote unquote indentured servants. And also people were just abducted off of the streets and brought over here. And this is how they were brought over here. In chains. This is uh, a lithograph I found depicting uh, people getting off the boat coming into Boston. And you can imagine what it was like that, that first day where they had to stand there and look at their Puritan masters. They were, they were divvied up and they were sent to different people and this is what happened. But you know what most of these Irish guys did as soon as they hit the ground? A lot of them did I should say. They ran away. Yeah, they wouldn't put up with it. This is fascinating. This, this is a runaway slave ad, two runaway slave ads. Let me point this out here. Maybe you can read this. One is for a Negro fellow and the other is for an Irishman. The Irish and the African Americans would actually help each other escape. They'd uh, try to help each other on the escape and stay at large, but more often than not, the African Americans would be caught. And it's simply because they were black. They stuck out in the crowd. Now the Irish guy, as long as he kept his mouth shut and didn't speak any Gaelic, he could blend in with the population. But a lot of the times they got caught and they were brought back and this is the treatment they got. Yes, put in the stalks of the pillory. That doesn't look so bad. Hmm. You might even get a tan. Yeah, just sit out there. It, th this was nothing. That, this is not a very good representation of what would happen. Uh, if you were putting the stocks in the pillory, it was usually in the town square, and people would come from all over the village with any kind of offal or garbage or anything to throw at you and harangue you for the whole day. It was pure and simple humiliation. The Puritans liked that. And if you escaped again, it escalated. This is what you might get as a punishment. You would be whipped at the cart's tail. This is simple. You are tied to the back of the cart and you are dragged around the streets of the city being whipped. And of course, everybody comes out on the street to harangue you and throw anything they can get their hands on at you. This is the America that the Irish came to. And this is the location where a lot of this happened. 
This is the townhouse. This is where I, show, where I was talking to you about the uh, area that is now State Street. Uh, the building no longer exists, but you can see the pillory there. There's a whipping post. All that happened right in the town square where the townhouse was. You probably are familiar with this location. Let me show you what it looks like today. <laughs> yes, that townhouse was replaced with the state house. Uh, and today is actually the anniversary of the Boston Massacre. So this is interesting. You know it for the Boston Massacre, but you don't know it for all the Irish were, that were mistreated here. Well, how about those Scots-Irish? We, uh, growing up Irish Catholic, I, I, I don't think I really knew who the Scots-Irish were. Um, I thought maybe they were just Irish people that drank a lot of scotch or something. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I apologize to people that are Scots-Irish, just my ignorance. But the Scots-Irish were actually, they were transplants from Scotland. The Scots-Irish were Presbyterians who were fellow Calvinists. You could say they were, they were theological brethren of the Puritans. And um, they were brought over because uh, eventually um, what happened was the uh, Puritans fell out of favor. After about 10 years, I, I, I really think uh, the English got sick of the Puritans. They were no fun. <laughs> and they brought the king back. The only problem was the king didn't have a head. His son was the next best thing. That's Charles II. And what happened, uh, as the, a lot of these uh, P, uh, Presbyterian Scottish had been settled in Northern Ireland here during the Puritan era. And what happened was when the Puritans fell out of favor, this Sacramental Test Act was passed, which basically said, if you're not an Anglican minister, anywhere within the kingdom you cannot preach. And a lot of these Presbyterians knew that in America, the Puritans still held sway. It was a big pond, and they, they weren't affected by this, this uh, downturn in their favor. So they decided that they would make overtures to the Puritans to see if they could come over here, and they corresponded with this fellow. This is Cotton Mather. May sound familiar. Um, Salem witch trials? Uh, and he encouraged them to come over, it, it, and, and they thought they would be uh, with their fellow Calvinists here in Boston that it was going to be great. And they got over here, and it was a bait and switch operation, basically. When they got here, they were like, oh, well, you know, some of you can stay here in Boston, but we want most of you to move out into western Massachusetts, Maine, and New Hampshire. And if you look at it, they were setting up a little line of buffer between the Native Americans and the city. So let's put those Scots. And you know what it is? Even though they were, they were religious companions, they were still Scottish. And the English and the Scottish don't get along. Did you know that? And here's, here's something to look at. Uh, they did establish a church in Boston. It was the location of where this church is, 100 Federal Street. This is what it looked like back then. And this is what the Puritans called it. The Church of the Presbyterian Strangers. <laughs> So that right there tells you how the Puritans felt about these Scots-Irish. Oh, by the way, did you know that John F. Kennedy was not the first Irish president? A lot of people go, it was Andrew Jackson, Scots-Irish. Now, maybe you um, are familiar with this location. Let me show you what it looks like today. No. Oh. And I couldn't fit the whole thing in, so I did that. Now, the, the Church of the Presbyterian Strangers, the con congregation still exists today as a congregational church. Uh, it is the Arlington Street Congregational Church over by uh, the uh, Boston Commons. So that, that congregation, the body itself, survives today. Hmm. So the struggle begins. We have, we have a small... Irish people in this Puritan enclave and we start having problems right away. Here's a little sign that we have a problem. There was a rumor that was going around Boston. The Puritans heard that there was a Jesuit priest 
skulking around the city, probably having mass in people's basements out in the woods someplace. So they decided to pass this law, the anti-Catholic law of 1647. Here is the language. I'll read it to you here. Death to all and every Jesuit seminary priest, missionary, or other spiritual ecclesiastical person made or ordained by any authority, power, jurisdiction, derived, challenged, or pretended from the Pope or the See of Rome. <laughs> Translation, no Catholics. No priests, no Catholics. In I haven't been able to find out whether that rumor was true, but I tend to think it might have been that they were probably worshiping underground because they knew they couldn't come out in the open and have their own church. So this was probably true. Now they did it under pain of death. And here we have another thing that happened a few years later in 1688. Uh, this is the home of John Goodwin. He was a Puritan. He, this home was up in uh, the North End of Boston. And uh, he brought into his house Goodwife Glover, who was in her 60s, and her two daughters. Now, Goodwife Glover had been brought over as an indentured servant years before in the West Indies with her husband. And it was said, the, the literature says that he was killed because he refused to renounce his religion. She spoke uh, like broken Gaelic and Irish. And she uh, had a bit of an attitude. She was a strong woman. Now an incident occurred where Goodwin's daughters accused Goody Glover's daughters of stealing laundry of all things. And Goodwife Glover got wind of this and went right over there and gave them the wherefore and took them down a few pegs. And then after she left, after they had this altercation, she left, the daughters started having these spells where they'd fall on the ground and have fainting spells and start shivering and tremoring and saying that she was putting a curse on them. Does that sound familiar? This was the template for Salem. And if you do that, she was a, pretty soon accused of being a witch. And when you're accused of being a witch, you're brought in before a magistrate. And they use this. This is the handbook on how to identify witches. The first step is you ask the accused witch if they can recite the Lord's Prayer. And they told Goody Glover to recite the Lord's Prayer. And she did except she did it in Latin. Oh, that was a no-no. <laughs> you can't recite the Lord's Prayer properly, so you are a witch. And you know what happens to witches. She wouldn't admit to being a witch because she wasn't one. Therefore, she had to be punished. Now, a lot of people think that these executions took place um, on Boston Common. It was, it said Boston Common, but the common land was Boston Neck over on Washington Street. And this is probably where she was hanged. Now it's interesting, a few years back I was, I was in the North End and I was uh, walking around. When we go to the North End, what do we think of? We think of nice Italian food, right? Because now it's, it's an Italian uh, neighborhood, or was. It's, kind of becoming something else now, more of a um, restaurant place. Um, and uh, I was going through the North End, and I, I actually came across an Irish restaurant in the North End. And I thought, wow, how can they have an Irish restaurant in the North End? Little did I know at that time that uh, the North End had been an Irish ghetto long before it was Italian. <clears throat> now, they had this Irish restaurant, which is now out of business, I guess the corned beef doesn't stand up to the <laughs> lasagna. And uh, they had this plaque outside. It, the, the name of the restaurant was Goody Glover's. And the plaque uh, pegs her as the first Irish martyr in Boston. And when you leave the restaurant, they had this portrait of what she might have looked like. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I've read, I've read pretty extensively on this, and, and the Puritans knew what they were doing. Uh, some of the Puritans objected to this because they knew what was happening. She wasn't executed because she was a witch. 
She was executed because she was Irish, she was Catholic, and she was a woman, and she was mouthy. That's why she got it. Now, let's go back to England, huh? Did you know that England has a holiday much like our 4th of July? They have fireworks, they celebrate, they dance in the street. It's, uh, it's not in July, though, it's in November. And it celebrates the gunpowder plot. Now, what happened was this, there was this group of clandestine Catholics that planted these barrels of gunpowder underneath Parliament, and they planned to blow Parliament sky high. And some of you may be saying, why do they celebrate this? If you don't know, the gunpowder plot was foiled. There was a man who was assigned to guard the gunpowder the night before this explosion was supposed to happen. His name was Guy Fox, hence Guy Fox Day. Here he is, he's guarding the gunpowder, and then they came in and they found him red-handed with all this gunpowder. He was arrested, and soon he was brought to London Tower. And you know what they do to people in London Tower. With, within a short amount of time, he gave up the names of all of his confederates. And they hauled in all these people that were involved in this plot. They were quickly put on trial and they were convicted of treason. Now, in, in these days, you did not want to be convicted of treason in England, in Britain. Um, it wasn't just a firing squad or something. Uh, this is probably the reason why we have the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution, which is there shall be no cruel and unusual punishment. The punishment for treason was to be drawn to the gallows, brought up to the gallows, and then hanged within an inch of your life. Then they'd cut you down, gasping for air, tie you onto a table, and slit you from stem to stern and pull out your intestines while you were still conscious. And then they do the quartering part. This is being drawn and quartered, if you didn't guess. And this is how they did it a lot of the times. They take your head and they put it on London Bridge as a warning to anybody who commits treason. Now, some of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with the Irish in Boston? Well, it's not just gratuitous violence. Uh, this holiday was brought over to Boston with the folks from England, and it came over, but they didn't call it Guy Fawkes Day. In Boston, they called it uh, Pope's Day. And here's an illustration showing what they did on Pope's Day. You see, each neighborhood in Boston, each uh, Puritan, or now, now they're pretty much being called Yankees, uh, would put together a, an effigy of the Pope. And they'd drag it through all the other neighborhoods in town, and the other neighborhoods would try to tear it up. So at the end of the day, the neighborhood who had an effigy that was still somewhat intact won the day. And there was a lot of drinking and crowsing and celebrating, dancing in the streets. Pope's Day. Now, this lasted up until the Revolutionary War, actually right after Evacuation Day. And this man put an end to it. Let's see if you recognize this man. If you don't, look on your $1 bill. <laughs> George Washington was totally and utterly appalled at this. He knew there were Irish in his army that were dying for this country to stop this kind of tyranny. And he put an end to it, and that was the end of Pope's Day in Boston. Now, some, some time passes. Things start lightening up, and the Irish begin to emerge. They start to come out of the shadows, for lack of a better term. And here are some firsts here. This is the site of the first Catholic mass in Boston. And look at that date. 1788 was the first time they felt safe coming out and having a mass in Boston. In fact, that was the first Catholic mass in all of New England. And this is at the corner of Washington and School Streets. 
Ironically, that is the same corner that the Irish Famine Memorial is, right in here. And this is the first time they were able to worship freely. Here is uh, the first cathedral was built in 1803. And that was located over on Franklin Street. Now, if you go to the location today, you'll find this on the wall. The, the cathedral is no longer there. Uh, and it is on this building. This was once owned by St. John's Seminary. Uh, today, it is a restaurant. It's called Bon Pita. So if you want to have a nice meal, you can go here. The first Catholic, uh, Irish Catholic burial ground was uh, St. Augustine's over in South Boston on Dorchester Street. This was built in 1818. And the Irish Catholics tried to get their own burial ground for years and years and years, and it was blocked, blocked, blocked. And you know, as, as somebody that grew up Irish Catholic, I went to CCD and all that, and I learned, you have to be buried in consecrated ground. And my question was, where did all these Irish people get buried if there was no place to be buried? My answer came through research. I found that a lot of these folks were buried in paupers' burial grounds. They could identify the bodies. They, this, this one was actually discovered when they were building a roadway and, and came across these bodies. And they had uh, artifacts on them which you could identify as Irish Catholic. Um, my theory is that probably they were buried here and the priest maybe sprinkled some holy water on the dirt and that made it consecrated ground. But it wasn't until 1818 the first Irish Catholic newspaper was the pilot which still exists today. Now, you know, I guess if you go and ask the man on the street, uh, if you say, to anybody on the street, you say, um, when did the first Irish come here? With the great um, education system we have in this country, they would probably say, uh, uh, the 1920s uh, had something to do with a potato? Mm? That, that's probably the answer you get, if, or if anything. Um, and they're thinking of the potato famine, which happened in the 1840s. We'll get to that. But actually, there was a great migration that happened in the 1820s. And it was because of these things here. There were a series of laws called the Penal Laws that were passed by the British government against the Irish. And let me read you a few of these. Irish Catholic was forbidden to exercise his religion. He could not receive an education. He could not enter a profession, could not hold public office, engage in trade. Further on down here, could not be guardian to your child, uh, couldn't hold an annuity, couldn't educate your child, could not attend Catholic worship. This is stripping away the human rights of these folks over in Ireland. Now, that's not even the end of it. Now, if you still owned land in Ireland and it hadn't been uh, taken by the English, they passed these laws. And if you look at this, if you still own land, you couldn't cultivate it, you couldn't cut hay, you couldn't graze animals on it. If you had a pond on it, you couldn't even fish for the, pond, the fish. Uh, you couldn't timber. You couldn't do anything with that land to, to get money from it, except for one thing sell it to an Englishman. And that's what a lot of people did. They just sold out and they headed for America. And Boston was one of the places they ended up. And we can see this. If you look at the census of Boston uh, when this started, 1820 is when it pretty much started. And there was a, a good amount of Irish in the city, 2,000 people. Five years later, it jumped to 5,000. And by the end of the decade, uh, 7,000 Irish people. And to put this into context, there was about 60, 61,000 people living in Boston at the time. So now you've got a lot of Irish in Boston, a lot more than you've ever had. And we start having more problems. These, uh, these are a couple of the problems. There were many things that happened, early conflicts. 
And uh, I kind of picked out the, the biggest ones here. Now this is uh, Mount St. Benedict uh, Convent here, or Ursuline Convent. It is located, the location would now be in Somerville. Back then it was Charleston, Charlestown, I'm sorry. I know it's not Boston, but it's close enough. This was a, a Catholic convent, but it was also a girls' school. These nuns ran a girls' school. And uh, ironically, the girls that attended the school were all of Puritan stock, Brahmins, Boston Brahmins, that went here because they knew they could get the best education here. Now some things started to happen that caused problems. The first thing that happened was this lady named Rebecca Reed. She was of Puritan stock. She was given a scholarship to come here and she attended school here and all accounts say that she was happy, that she was so happy she was started the process, she started the process of becoming Catholic and with the intent of becoming a nun. And then all of a sudden she vanished. And a few months later, this book came out. Six months in a convent. It was this scurrilous manuscript that said these nuns were torturing the girls in there. Uh, they were inculcating the girls, trying to convert them to Catholicism. They had people, she had people being chained in the basement, all these horrible things. None of it was true. People began, people read this and in, in town, people started clucking, what's going on in this convent? We should find out what's going on in this convent. And then another incident happened. This is Sister Mary St. John. She was the music teacher uh, at the Ursuline Convent. And uh, from what I read, she was teaching a class. It was in the middle of summer. I guess they had school in the middle of summer. And something happened. She became very frustrated. And she threw down her baton and she stormed out of that classroom. Now, as a teacher, I can totally understand that. <laughs> Uh, she ended up in the front parlor of a Brahmin family, a Boston Brahmin family, Yankee family, and uh, vented to them about her day. And pretty soon the mother superior, her name was Sister Mary St. George, was on the scene and they sat down at the table and they had a chat. She had calmed down by this time and was quite embarrassed. Sister Mary St. George said, let's just go back. All right, all right, mother. And she, she went back to the convent with the Mother Superior. Now the word got out in town that they dragged her back kicking and screaming and that she was probably chained in the basement someplace. So people, more people are clucking. Now it got, to the, it got to the point where the selectmen of Charlestown went over and they knocked on that door and they demanded that Sister Mary St. George come to the door. She didn't come to the door. She stuck her head out this window here. And they were like, we demand to look in this convent and inspect it. And in, in so many words, she told them to take a go for and leak, leap. She, uh, she was a tough bird. And, and they turned right around, they huffed off and they went to the bishop who was more of a, a politician. And he went to her and he said, look, let them in. We've got nothing to hide. Let them look around. And they did. She, she begrudgingly let them in. They walked around. They looked around. They talked to the girls there. They loved their teachers. They loved their classes. They, none of them were being brainwashed. None, there were no chains in the basement. This was all baloney. The only thing was, once they left that convent, they didn't make an announcement. They didn't tell anybody. And the clucking continued. And then this guy showed up. This is Reverend Lyman Beecher. He was a fire and brimstone preacher, father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. He gave three fiery sermons in Boston. That book there was a book he was pushing. It was an anti-Catholic book. In one of his sermons, he actually advocated the burning of the cathedral. So this is, you might say, the match that lit the whole thing. Just a few days later, a mob started to form outside the convent. People began to chant, let her out, let her out, as this nun is still chained in the basement or something. 
and it got to a fever pitch. They got up to the door, they started slamming on the door, and Sister Mary St. George stuck her head out the window and told them off, which was not the right thing to do, because they kicked the door in at that point, they stormed into the convent, and they began looting it. There's stories of pianos going flying through the windows. They were going through the nun's clothing. They were taking the chalice. One guy jumped into the, the church and he went into the tabernacle and took the holy host and stuck it in his pocket. And after all this happened, he was in a bar room showing everybody the host. And this, this just reached a fever pitch. Now I must say the girls and the nuns, once the mob came in the front door, they went out the back door. And, and this reached a fever pitch. Somebody lit a match and the thing went up in flames. And the fire department came and stood and watched it burn. Now in the morning when all of Boston woke up and they could see the smoldering ember across the river, even the Brahmins on Beacon Hill were shocked that this happened. Now the mayor and the governor got together and they, they had heard the rumors that the, the cathedral was next. So they called out the militia, stationed them over at the, the Holy Cross Cathedral. And within a couple days, the mob formed again. They headed for the cathedral, boom, they ran into the soldiers. They turned right around and went back to pick over what was left. And this is all that was left. Except they didn't raid the tombs of the nuns, the former nuns that had died there. And they started to loot the tombs of the women that had died there, the former nuns. It's said that they pulled the gold fillings out of their teeth. This is a real black spot on the history of Boston in Charlestown. Now, if you go to this location today, uh, you'll find this monument. The hill was, the hill was leveled. It's no longer Mount St. Benedict. It's not really there anymore. This is just a, a few yards away from the Somerville Library. It's actually about a, a half a mile from the actual location of where all this happened. And if you go there today, this is the neighborhood. Right where that house is is about where that convent was. And I walked through that neighborhood and I looked up in the windows and I thought, you think any of these people know anything about this? Probably not. There's nothing to tell you other than that plaque and this sign that says Benedict Street, that's about it. And then there was the Broad Street riot. Now, if you go to Broad Street today, this is the financial district of Boston. It's where you have all those skyscrapers. It was the first Irish ghetto. At this time, in the 1830s, it was uh, all wooden tenement buildings. And this is where the Irish lived. And there's not too many buildings left from this period. If you look at the brickwork, you can tell that building was probably witness to what I'm about to tell you about. Now, what happened in 1834, there was a, a group of Irish mourners coming back from an Irish wake. Now, I don't know, is it true what they say about Irish wakes? I don't know, but uh, there, and then there was a group of Yankee firemen coming back from a fire. They were cro they crossed paths in the in the street. Somebody said something to someone, and a brawl broke out. Pretty soon, all of the buildings, everybody emptied out into the street, and there was a giant pandemonium melee in the streets. And it turned into a riot. And you can imagine what it looked like. People were just grabbing anything at hand and bashing people over the head, fighting. Uh, the, the, uh, the neighborhood, the Yankee neighborhood, soon was on the scene. And the Yankees were going into the Irish houses and they were looting them. It was just a horrible scene. Now, finally, they called in the militia. They calmed it down. And a number of people were arrested. There were both Yankees arrested and Irish. They were brought to court, and guess who got convicted? The Irish. the Irish, right. No Yankees, it was all the Irish. So this is the Boston that the Irish came to. And then it happened, 1845. The potato crop failed. The next year was worse, the next year even worse. Now, here, here's another testament to my great public education. Uh, 
I always thought, how come the Irish just ate potatoes? Um, but I found out, you know, this is years later, I found out there were, there were plenty of crops in Ireland. There were, there, were wheat, there were wheat crops, barley crops, you name it. They were growing it. And you know why the Irish ate potatoes? They literally ate potatoes morning, noon, and night. They ate potatoes because they lived in these little enclosures. They had been relegated to uh, somewhat of sharecroppers. They were living in these little cottages, in these little yards, and they were working on the big farms for the both Irish, wealthy Irish and wealthy English landlords. And the only thing that you could grow in such a small place that was, was bountiful in a small place was the potato. You could, if you had an acre, you could live on that potato crop for an entire year. When that potato blight hit, that eliminated their food source. And they began to starve, even though food is being shipped out. At first, the British government tried to set up soup kitchens. And the soup they gave them was worthless. It was totally unnutritional. It was more, oh, we're doing something. Look like what, what they're, we're doing. Uh, they established workhouses so the Irish could uh, go and work and make money to buy food. Now, they figured that the, the, the uh, free market would take care of this, the new administration. Now, it's interesting. Uh, Sir, Sir Robert Peel's government was a conservative government. Back then, conservative meant liberal. And Sir John Lord Russell's government was liberal. They were what you would call conservative today. They believed in laissez-faire, let it alone. The government should stay out of it. And that's what they did. They felt that the free market would take care of this and that the people would be able to just buy these fo the food. They couldn't afford anything except for the potatoes, and people just began to die in droves. And here are some pictures that will really uh, personify this. On top of it, the poor laws were passed. The British government stepped back and put the onus on landlords to take care of their own tenants. And this is how they took care of them. Mass evictions. You're too sick to work. You can't pay your rent. Therefore, I'm going to evict you. And they were evicted. They, they were sent out into the woods, out into the wilderness to forage for food out there. Many people built these things called skibbereens. Here you have one now. Nothing more than a lean-to out in the woods. And they just scavenge for food. These drawings that I'm showing you were done from life by actual newspaper reporters that were on the scene. And these, these were seen all over the world, all over England, uh, all over the world. In Boston, got to give the old Boston uh, Brahmins uh, a uh, compliment here. They did put together a, a relief ship called the Jamestown that they sent in for relief of the Irish famine. But other than that, nothing was really being done. And look at these. Th these. These pictures tell the story. This is horrendous. I looked at this and I was shocked. I, I thought, is that woman dead? And she's got a baby suckling on her? What's that boy doing? He's eating his shoe leather. Look at dad's outside trimming bark off the tree. Are they going to eat the bark now? This, this was the situation and the deaths just kept escalating. It's thought to be between 800 million and a, I'm sorry, 800,000 and a million deaths. I heard one statistic, a million died, a million left. And here's, here's more. Now, I came across one uh, story. There was an American over here at the time, and he was uh, being shown around by his Irish host. They were up on a wagon going down the street, and literally there were dead bodies on the side of the streets. And he noticed something peculiar about the dead bodies. He noticed that they all had green rings around their mouths. And he said, how come they all have green rings around their mouths? 
And his host said, oh, that's because they've been eating the grass. You can't live on grass, you know. And as I said, uh, between 800,000 and a million. Now the other million were able to scrape together enough money to get passage to America because getting to America at the time was pretty cheap, especially the way they got here. Now this statuary is in Dublin. This is how they got onto the ships. They were diseased. They had typhoid, dysentery, tuberculosis, you name it. And they got onto these ships in this condition. And here's what they got onto. They were crammed to the gills. They called these ships the coffin ships. Can you imagine being in that hold for two months? People are sick, they're dying. The stench that you'd have to put up with. And I see these, uh, these types of uh, images. And it brings me back to my days when I taught US history and I taught about the, uh, the middle passage and the tight pack and the loose pack, the slaves being brought over. And although they're not chained there, it's not too far off from it. And just like those slave ships every morning, they'd be heaving the bodies overboard. But imagine the joy they felt when they saw that first glimmer of land. And they really believed this was uh, the land of milk and honey, that the streets were paved in gold. This was, this was their rescue. And what they came to was not that. Um, many of these people came into the major cities, Boston, Philadelphia, New York. Some of them had families there waiting for them. Some of them did not they found that these cities were already massively overcrowded and they just added to it. Uh, especially New York. A lot of them ended up in what was called the Five Points area. Today it would be called Little Italy, I guess, Chinatown and around there. And uh, Charles Dickens toured this area shortly after the potato blight and he said that, that it was the worst slum he had ever seen. It was worse than Calcutta in India. In Boston, in 1847, I believe the, there were 38,000 Irish that flooded into Boston alone. It was a deluge. Speaking of Boston, this is the famous uh, famine memorial that you'll find down in Washington in school. Now, when I first saw this, I had my own interpretation. I, I didn't research what the artist's interpretation was. I, I saw this as, this is how the Irish came here. And what I saw was, this is the modern Irish family. It's supposed to be that same family years later. But I like my interpretation better. Because if you look at the ju juxtaposition here, I like to think that this is the modern Irish family, and they should look back and remember where they came from. Now, when they got here, uh, they were farmers, and they landed in cities, and there are no farms in cities. My eighth graders didn't know that when I told them. We were doing feudalism, yes. Uh, housing, they got here and they found out uh, that they, the housing available was minimal, and they got crammed into these ghettos in Boston. Now, the areas that they settled were the Boston waterfront, the Battery March, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, Broad Street, which you saw, the North End in East Boston. Everyone knows about South, Bo South Boston. They were not in South Boston until much later. South End, maybe, but not South Boston. And this is a picture of Boston in the 1850s, so you can get an idea of what they came to. Now, the conditions were horrid. Um, they were moved into these uh, sheds, barns, stables, low ceiling garrets, basements, cellars, anywhere they could shove people because Boston was already overcrowded. And these are some examples of places that they lived. Now, 
if you go to Boston today, um, you might come across an area like this. Uh, I took this, I was um, in the North End, I was up there uh, at a restaurant called Strega, having a nice Italian meal. And uh, I walk, I, my wife says, you always see what used to be there and not what, what, what is here. And I look down this alley and uh, when I, I don't see the gentrified neighborhood that it is today, what I see is what it was and it probably looked a lot like this. Crowded tenements, people doing their laundry out in the streets here. Uh, you can imagine what maybe Hanover Street looked like. It probably looked like that. And of course, these are pictures taken after the 1840s. And here are some more shots of what the North End looks like today. It was the first, it was an Irish ghetto. Now, here, this gives you an idea of what it was like in these, in these ghettos. One survey showed that one uh, neighborhood had 67 toilets and 118 houses uh, inhabited by 540 immigrants. 17 of those were out of order. One sink might serve a whole tenement building. One outhouse might serve a whole neighborhood. People were still dying. They came, they had these diseases, and it continued for a long time afterwards because of these conditions. Now, this is what they had for work. This is what you had. Now, women didn't have too many opportunities. They had two. You could be a washerwoman. This is where you scrub floors on your hands and your knees for the entire day, mainly up in Beacon Hill, the Boston Brahmins. Or you could be one of the, the chambermaids that they had. That was it, pretty much. Men had more opportunity. You could be a waiter. Now, I found uh, that uh, I, the, some of the Irish wanted to come over and be barbers, but they found that the barber market had already been cornered by the African Americans, and they couldn't even get a job being a barber. Uh, you could work in a grocery store. I guess this is the modern day equivalent to the 7-Eleven. Good jobs. And if there wasn't a sign outside that said no Irish need apply, which there were, you could work in one of these sweatshops for about 14 hours a day, six days a week in the freezing cold in winter and in the extreme heat in the summer and you didn't get any breaks because you're doing piecework. The minute you leave that machine, you're losing money. But it was better than starving. And this is what Boston looked like at the time. And this is before the EPA. Yes. Uh, here are some other opportunities. You could be a longshoreman down on the Boston waterfront, and everything that went into that ship was on, on the backs of Irishmen. And there's the waterfront uh, during these times. There it is today. Or you could be the quintessential ditch digger, muckraker, black legs. That's what they call them. And a lot of these men work themselves to death. This is, this is interesting because the next segment's gonna be a little political and all these politicians that I'm gonna tell you about is a common thread. Their fathers all died young. Hard work. And you know what? You could literally say the Irish built Boston and it started with the leveling of Beacon Hill and this is what they did to Boston. This is what they got from the Puritans and this is what they did to it. With the dirt from Beacon Hill, they filled in the Mill Pond area, and that's 1830. And then these two areas were filled in. It's funny, if you go to Chinatown today, there's a street called Beach Street. There's no beach there anymore. The West Cove, and then finally, the Back Bay. Of course, there were steam shovels by this time, but there were Irish 
hands working those steam shovels. This was all done with Irish labor. Now, you can imagine this flood of immigration caused a great backlash in America. And the backlash took the form of a political party that once had been a secret society. They were called the Know-Nothings. And eventually they called themselves the Native American Party. Now they were called the Know-Nothings because if anybody who wasn't part of their group said, so what are you up to? They would say, I know nothing. Kind of like Sergeant Schultz. Now, now they, they were really a dichotomy in terms of uh, what their beliefs were. Uh, this is an this is ad I found kind of giving you some of their, their beliefs. They were anti-immigrant, they were anti-Irish, they believed in eradicating the teaching of foreign languages, they were anti-Catholic, uh, but they were abolitionists. They believed in eradicating slavery. This party was not long-lived, they only lasted about 10 years, and they splintered. The abolitionist wing eventually would become the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln. Now, the know-nothings came into office in Massachusetts, and they swept the 1854 elections. Listen to this. This has never been done before or since. They won all 40 state Senate races. They carried every U.S. constitutional district. Out of 381 seats up for election, they won 379, and they had a know-nothing governor elected. I know what you're thinking. He wasn't the first, right? <laughs> There's been a lot of know-nothing since then. <laughs> and his platform was simply, his, in his inaugural address, he saw the biggest problem facing Massachusetts was the massive influx of Irish Catholics, and they needed to do something about this. And this is what they did. They passed laws that only said the King James Bible could be read in public schools. They banned the teaching of all foreign languages. They disbanded all Irish military militias. They proposed a constitutional amendment to forbid Roman Catholics from holding office in Massachusetts. It failed by a narrow margin. Under the Pauper Removal Act, they took 1,300 Irish paupers, collected them over on Deer Island, and shipped them back to Ireland. And also, they had formed, they had a special committee form, the Committee of Inspection of Convents. And here's a cartoon showing this. They thought, I don't know what, they still thought there was something going wrong in all these convents, so they had to inspect them. Here's a group of inspectors. What have they found? Oh, they found a rosary. And what's that under the bed? Chamber pot. Oh. Also known as the thunder jug. So that, that, that gives a little bit of levity to this, this crazy type of thinking here. And what I'm about to show you are some of the some of the cartoons in the newspapers at the time, this wasn't just Boston, this was the entire United States that felt this way. Here we go. Here's one. It's the poor house from Galway coming. We're going to have to take care of all these poor people. Our taxes are going to go up. And this one needs a little bit of explaining. Those are not alligators. Those are bishops in mitre hats landing on the shores of America threatening the innocent Native Americans, so-called Native Americans. And in the distance looming is St. Peter's Cathedral, the Vatican. Now this is a very nice portrait of an Irishman compared to what I'm going to show you. And mind you, this, this is all in American newspapers. Uh, some of these cartoons were made by Thomas Nast, the famous great Thomas Nast. There he is, the ape-like, ne'er-do-well, drunkard Irishman living in his shanty. Oh, and they're brawlers, too, the fighting Irish. A lot of these stereotypes are still being perpetuated. What do we do on St. Patrick's Day, hmm? We drink, right? 
Here's another one. I like this. Uh, oh, and God forbid that they get involved in politics because you know who's pulling the strings, right? I think they were saying this up until uh, 1960. <laughs> right, yeah, the Pope's going to tell them what to do. So this, this, these are the things that were in the newspapers, blatant. And oh, there was a, another group of people they didn't like too much, the Chinese. Oh, I love this. Who would you rather as your nurse? Florence Nightingale or Bridget McBruzer? <laughs> Here's Lady Liberty grabbing that Irishman by the neck. Well, you know what? After a little while, the Irish got sick of it. And they started to organize and get political, something they do very well, as we know. And it all started with Patrick McGuire here over on the right. Uh, he uh, formed what they called the Young Men's Democratic Society, which was kind of an aid for the Irish in Boston. If you came to Ireland, uh, from Ireland to Boston, you could go there and you, they would help you become a citizen. They would help you find places to live, a job, those sort of things. These clubs started popping up all over the city. The beginning of ward politics, you might say. Now, they started out thinking, we have to get some of our own people elected to public office, but they started out small. And you started to see Irish lamplighters and Irish dog catchers, things like that. And then, then they got some people elected to city council. And then they got one of their own elected mayor, Hugh O'Brien. Took them to 1885. Now, uh, I call this the age of cooperation because some of the more liberal um, Brahmins on Beacon Hill helped out. They were working cooperatively with these Irish. In fact, in the newspapers, they refer referred to Hugh O'Brien as a clean Irishman. <laughs> and then after Hugh O'Brien, we had the second Irish Catholic mayor, and that was Patrick Collins. Now, by this time, there were these political clubs all over Boston. Probably the most prominent, the most powerful was the one over in the west end of Boston, which doesn't even really exist anymore. They wiped that whole neighborhood out in the 1950s. This man's name was Martin Lemansney. They called him the Boston Mahatma. And he had a club called the Hendricks Club, which would be located over on Lemansney Way today, uh, about where the west end um, West End um, Museum is. Now, he was the best. You knew if you went to Lamansney, if you needed a job, he'd get it for you. If you needed housing, he'd get it for you. If he needed the wheels of government to work a little quicker and get you a, a, as a, a United States citizen, he could get it for you. And he only asked one thing of you. One thing. You know what that was? Your vote. If he told you to vote for candidate X, you voted for candidate X. He controlled the entire West End. Very, very powerful man. And he had some protégés. Here are some of his protégés. This is a young guy from the North End. He was working his way up through the political chain. His name was Johnny Fitz. Johnny Fitz Fitzgerald. And uh, he was just a ball of energy. And uh, one time he was with a, a bunch of people and they were saying, hey, Johnny Fitz, Johnny Fitz. And there was a reporter skulking around. And he heard that, but he misheard it as Honey Fitz. And forever after he became known as Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, yes. And then there was another one over in East Boston. His name, P.J. Kennedy. And he owned a saloon over in East Boston. And you know that's where all the politics happened. Same thing, if you needed anything, he'd help you out. But you better vote his way. And then a few years later, there was an up-and-comer over in the South End, not to be confused with South Boston, and that was James Michael Curley. All these guys kind of studied at the foot of Lemansney. This guy, Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. Now, of course you know where this is going. The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys. Now, when we think of the Kennedys, we think of Hyannis and, and West Palm Beach. Uh, 
this is where it started. This is Borg Garden Court in the north end of Boston, right off of North Square. His father died, and he had to take control of the whole family. And eventually, he moved his, his family into this tenement. This is where Rose Kennedy was born. They were not born with uh, silver spoons in their mouths. If you go there today, it looks like uh, the front door hasn't been painted since then. <laughs> this is where he started. And he eventually became the ward boss of the North End. Now, he knew everybody in the North End. And when he'd go there and he'd see people from the North End, he'd say, my dear Rose, he called them, my dear Rose. And then it became any from, anyone from Boston, my dear Rose. And then here's P.J. Kennedy a few years later. He became the powerhouse over in East Boston. And as you know, the two families eventually merged. Here we have Joe Kennedy over on the right there. And you can see Rose Kennedy. And years later, here's P.J. with his grandson. You might recognize him. Here's my favorite. James Michael Curley. Now, Curley was born in the South End, right in back of uh, what was called then City Hospital on Northampton Street. If you look at this building here, uh, his, his building was right next to it. So I imagine it was probably a bunch of row houses. Now, like Honey Fitz, his father uh, died early. Uh, his father was one of these laborers. He was a big man. And his fellow workers used to joke with him and have him do big things. There was a big boulder. And they asked Curly's father, go pick it up. And he lumbered over there. And he went, he went, picked up the boulder, had a massive aneurysm, and fell dead on the ground right there. So James Michael Curley's mother and his brother and he were left without a father. He had to leave eighth grade and go to, go to work immediately. Uh, now, his mother had to become a washerwoman, one of these women that were down on their knees scrubbing floors. He became a drug clerk. He would run um, drug uh, deliveries to different houses around, around the city. And one of the patrons got to talking to him and one day said, oh, James Michael, you've got the gift of gab. You should become a politician. And he took the advice. He ended up becoming a city councilman. And uh, he got his own club there, the Tammany Club of all things, over on uh, Hamden Street. Um, this is what it looks like, that location today. But he got himself in a little bit of trouble during these days. Maybe you've heard of this. Uh, as city councilman, he was one of these ward bosses still. And people would come to him and ask him for favors. One time, this gentleman came up to him, and he said, Oh, James Michael, I flunked the postal exam. Why did you do that? Well, I couldn't spell Constantinople. So Curly said, I'll fix that for you. And he went in the next time they had one of these exams, one of these postal exams, passed himself off as this constituent, took the exam with his eighth grade education and passed it with flying colors. The only problem was he got caught, put in jail. And uh, this man was elected mayor of Boston four times. He was elected governor of Massachusetts. He was a congressman. And every time he ran for office, they'd hit him with this. Did you commit fraud? And he'd say the same thing. I did it for a friend. And that cemented his relationship with his constituents because they know here we have a guy that's willing to stick out his neck for us. Curly. So, Mayor Collins dies, mid-term mid in office. Martin Lemansney has the next mayor all lined up. And it's not this guy. Honey Fitz wanted to be mayor, though, and he went against the machine. He went against Lemansney. And he left this age of cooperation, and his platform was, let's blame it all on the Yankees. 
and he got himself elected the third mayor of Boston from his club, the Jefferson Club, which was over on Chandler Street in the North End. And he went into office, and he went in on the slogan, let's make Boston bigger, better, and busier, and he did that. And this is where his office was, the beautiful city hall, which is still there today. Did you know they were going to tear this thing down in the 50s? And you know what replaced it, right? <laughs> Do you know what type of architecture this is called? <laughs> Brutalist. It is brutal. Uh, looks like an upside down cake or something. I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, modern architecture. <laughs> anyway. Uh, he loved being mayor. He loved the people of Boston, his Daros, and he served, you can just see it. He had this great sense of humor, great energy. Uh, a lot of times he'd show up in bar rooms and sing Sweet Adeline. And he was a total, he was a teetotaler. That's the funny thing. He never dropped, touched a drop. Now, uh, these, these Yankees that he, he kind of uh, laid in the ditch during his, uh, his um, uh, election were kind of mad that he wasn't working with them and they formed this this group called the Good Government Association Curly would later call them the Goo Goos and uh, they started making accusations of um, uh, bribery and corruption and this caught up with Honey Fitz and he didn't win the second term and a few years later he ran again and he, he became uh, mayor once again but you can see he just loved being pr uh, the uh, mayor of, of Boston here. And I really think, I think uh, JFK got his sense of humor from Honey Fitz. He loved life. Here he is. Look at that guy. They called him the, the energetic pixie. Um, this is a great story. Years later, after he retired, they brought him down to Palm Beach in Florida. And uh, he would sit in hotel lobbies. Doesn't that sound sad? Listen to this. He would keep an ear out, and if anybody came up to the desk, ding, and they'd say, where are you from? If they said Boston, he'd jump out of the seat and say, my dear Rose! And he'd get a free lunch, and he'd give them the tour of Palm Beach and all that. And that was Honey Fitz. That was Honey Fitz. And if you want to visit Honey Fitz, Here's his, uh, here's his grave, and that, that's over in um, St. Joseph's Cemetery in Boston, and he died in 1950. Now, that's not the only memorial to him. This was another one. How many people remember sitting in traffic on the John Fitzgerald Highway? Yeah, it's no longer there, uh, but the Rose Kennedy Greenway, aptly named, is there. All right, so we're going to end it almost. He ran one more time, but he ran against James Michael Curley in the election of 1913. Now, the early straw polls indicated that Honey Fitz was way ahead of Curley, that he was going to take it. Of course, Curley's this little-known city councilman who spent some time in jail. And the thing was... Uh, Honey Fitz, like I said, he was this ball of energy. He belonged to almost every club in the city. And when he was campaigning, he was everywhere. He would show up at wakes and glad hand everybody and whiz out of there. And the, and the widow would be saying to everybody, I, I didn't know my Johnny knew him. He didn't. <laughs> and uh, almost every night at the end of a hard day of campaigning, he ended up at this one... Um, Roadhouse on the outskirts of Boston and sang his sweet Adeline every night and then uh, he would like to have a little dance with a cigarette girl by the name of Toodles <laughs> and can you imagine it? Just dancing with Toodles <laughs> and then one night he kissed her on the cheek. Now, innocent enough one of Curly's men was there and saw this massive act of infidelity. 
one day, the next day or two, Honey, Honey Fitz comes home and there's his wife sitting on the stairs with a, a letter in her hand, tapping it on her hand. James Michael Curley had written a letter to her she, telling her about this horrible infidelity of, of, of her husband. And, and he must have had the gift of gab because he talked to Rob and he said, it's this curly, flint hard ball. I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to drop out of this race. I will persevere. And Curly, if you can imagine, he's probably sitting there reading the papers waiting for the dropout notice. So, oh. so he went to plan B. Curly went to plan B. He decided that he would advertise a lecture series that he would be doing. Two lectures. One, great lovers in history. Cleopatra to Toodles. <laughs> great libertines in history. Henry VIII to present. Honey Fitz saw the writing on the wall. He saw his name was about to be dragged through the mud, and he decided to drop out, uh, probably to spend more time with his family. <laughs> and by default, James Michael Curley became the fourth Irish Catholic mayor of Boston. They call him the first modern politician, and I love this picture. He looks like heart gangster part politician there. <laughs> the velvet glove. Now, Curly, Curly was a fascinating person. When I researched him, I'd be reading about him and I'd think, what a great guy. And then a few pages later, what a horrible guy. <laughs> so I called, the, this is the end of the lecture. This is called the good, the bad, and the curly. <laughs> Let me tell you about the good curly. Uh, by the way, he would get a, elected mayor about every 10 years because he'd get elected mayor and they'd find out what he was like and then he wouldn't get elected. And 10 years later, they'd forget and elect him again. Good curly. First thing he did, his first day in office, was he demanded that all the scrubber women in the city hall be given mops. Think about it. Up off of their knees, now they have dignity. He said no woman should be on her knees unless she's praying to God. Uh, other things he did, his Tammany club, even while he was Tammany, he'd have Christmas dinner for the poor. He, he focused on the poor. He would take care of the poor. Anybody that was hungry, needed a job, needed housing. This continued right into when he was mayor. There was a line up and down the hallway every day. And also, as a politician, he used his influence to have great public works done in Boston, the South Boston bathhouses. Uh, what's called uh, Boston University Hospital now is Boston City Hospital. They should have called it the Curley Hospital because a lot of those buildings were built by James Michael Curley. Now, also, here's a story I came across, and it's, it was told by his driver, and the driver told this after he died. He said that uh, many, many nights, he, uh, Curly would work till 10, 11 at night, and he'd have to wait in the limo for Curly. Curly always had a limo driver. And the driver said a lot of the times there'd be this guy named Mike who was a drunk outside of City Hall staggering around. And, and oftentimes Curly would just go up to him with, uh, I don't know, probably a $10 bill, a $5 bill, and walk up to him and shake his hand and say, here, Mike, here's the money I owe. And you know what? There weren't any cameras. There weren't any reporters. Nobody was writing this down. That was the good Curly. It was a lot to be said about the good Curly. I had a man come up to me, uh, an, uh, an elderly man, and he said, when I was a boy, James Michael Curley came into our neighborhood and he bought us all ice cream. <laughs> that was the good curly. Now there's also the bad curly. And uh, here, here's some pictures of curly through the years. Um, I think that's the 20s. He was elected in the, the 10s, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s. It's kind of funny. Um, here he is through the 20s. And I want to show you what personifies the bad curly. Uh, this big mansion up on the Jamaica Way, he bought his first year as mayor and no way could he afford it. And the Goo Goos came into play and they started accusing him of bribery and all corruption, which was true. But he said, he said, oh, I have these great investments with this plumbing concern. And oddly enough, the plumber that he su supposedly had these investments with, with his name was Daly, my name. No, no name, no uh, relation, of course. So Curly, Curly um, had this house, and this, this is still there today. Now, the corruption charges were true. 
and many editors would charge him with corruption and uh, the next thing they knew they had a lawsuit on their hands. So that's how he stopped it. Um, here's a story that comes down to us from a roofer. This roofer came to Curley and he said, well, can you help me get a job? And Curley said, okay, let me look here. Okay, we've got a roof over in the south end on this school that needs to be replaced. Um, it's worth this. I want you to put in a bid much higher. And we'll get it, and you know where the excess money goes? <laughs> and this isn't the end of it. The, the roofer went up on the roof, and the roof was pristine. So he thought Curly made a mistake, and he went back down to Curly, and he said, there's nothing wrong with the roof. He goes, I know, just go up there and make like you're doing something, come back down, and we'll pay you. Oh, that was the bad Curly. Uh, Curly also had a temper, too. There was this editor named Enright that continually wrote him up as corrupt, as taking bribes, and the lawsuit thing didn't work with Enright. So one day, Enright was walking down Washington Street, nice summer's day, and he sees Mayor Curley coming down the same sidewalk. He's like, oh no, I guess I'll just kind of ignore him or something or nod to him. And as Curley approached, he wound up and he smacked this guy right on the jaw. And he went down to the sidewalk, and he went out like a light. He said, when, when I came to, Curly was standing over me, swearing his head off at me. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine Mayor Marty Walsh? <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Marty, yeah. And he also, there was a time when there was a, a, a circuit Somebody who was speaking for a candidate that was running against Curly on WBZ on the air, knocking Curly down. Little did he know that Curly was the next guest, and he was waiting in the wings. Curly went into the radio booth on air and pummeled the man. <laughs> this was the bad Curly. <laughs> now, uh, as the years went on. He got elected, this, this is in the 20s probably. Um, I'll take you through the 30s. Roosevelt, he wanted to be chums with Roosevelt, and then Roosevelt found out what he was like and distanced himself immediately. And then we get to the 1940s. He's getting kind of old, he's thinking of retirement. It was his last term in office, and he thought he would find some investments. He needed to. He had, it said that he had two giant safes full of cash in his house, and he wanted to invest that. So he was looking around, and he found these fellas in Nevada that had a silver mine, and he flew out there to look at the silver mine, and uh, they, t they took him into the mine, and it had bits of silver coming. He, they went through this tunnel in the ground, and there was actually bits of silver you could see in the tunnel. Little did he know that before they got there, before he got there, they had gone through and shoved the silver up into the dirt in the tunnel, and he was taken, the con man was taken. He put all of his money into this thing. And then these guys turned around, they made him the president of the company, and then they started using his name down in Washington to bribe people and peddle political influence. And he was arrested, and he was convicted of fraud and put in federal penitentiary. And he was still mayor in prison. Now, politicians all over New England signed a petition to release Curley, except for one. He was, uh, maybe you know who he is. Uh, he was a former PT boat captain in World War II. He was now a congressman, uh-huh. Yeah, kind of like karma. Well, he was released finally, he served out his term, his fourth term, and then he ran for a fifth term. And I won't even tell you how he got that license plate. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And he, he didn't get elected. And uh, Curly turned into this kind of sad character hanging around the state house. He was out of money. Uh, in fact, several of his children died. Two of his children died on the same day, and he felt he was cursed because of his actions. And he became a sad character. And I came across this story by Tip O'Neill. O'Neill was just a young congressman, 
And Curly hit him up and he said, is there anything I can do with you to make some money? And uh, O'Neill knew his whole situation. He knew about the mine. And, everything. and he said, sure. Can you get me some donors? Can you bring me in some good uh, money into my campaign? And Curly said, I've got the connections. I'll do it. And then you, next thing you know, Tip O'Neill starts getting calls from some of these donors saying things like, I thought I gave you 20000 Where's the rest? In Curly's pocket. That's where it went. So he was up to his old tricks. And, and you would think, what a sad story. He's scamming congressmen now. But uh, he kind of went out with a bang because this book was written. I don't know if you've ever read this book. The Last Hurrah by Boston author Edwin O'Connor. It's a fictional book about this Mayor Skeffington. But everybody who read it knew it was 150% curly, all of it. It was not fiction. The only thing that was fiction was this guy's name. Now, O'Connor was deathly afraid that he'd meet up with Curly someplace because he heard about what had happened to Enright and all these other people. And Curly was still, you know, a spry guy. And then one day he was getting out of his car in front of the state house, and here comes James Michael Curly running down the steps right at him, making a beeline for him. And he runs up to him, and he grabs his hand and he shakes it and he said, I love the book. I love the book, especially the part where I die. <laughs> and, then, and then Curly, what a, what a entrepreneur. Curly decides to go on a lecture tour as Mayor Skeffington all around the state, making more money. Well, to put the icing on the cake, they made a movie out of this, too, with another Irishman, Spencer Tra Tracy. So. That's how Curly went out. He went with a bang. And uh, here's his grave. He's at uh, Calvary Cemetery in Rosendale, actually not too far from Honeyfits. And uh, if you look at his grave, this is a bad photograph. Uh, it's like a resume. It gives all of his, his uh, titles and jobs here. But you know what? I think the title he most treasured was probably the mayor of the poor. Now, Curley was the, the governor of Massachusetts. So when he died, he was given the honor of laying in state under the rotunda of the state house. And from what I'm told, the line was up and down Beacon Street just to see James Michael Curley. Now, if you want to have a chat with James Michael, he's hanging out near uh, Quincy Market. I don't know. Is that the good, the bad? Curly? I don't know. <laughs> Which one is that? Uh, every year I would take my students over here and my eighth graders, and they sit on his lap and rub his belly and stuff. And uh, I'd say, "Do you know who that is?" And they'd say, "No." <laughs> and I'd say, "Take that thing that you're attached to. You know that thing that's permanently on your hands." And look in it and Google James Michael Curley. Maybe you'll learn something. OK. So folks, in conclusion, these people, the Irish, <clears throat> they came to our shores. And they endured ethnic and religious bigotry. They endured squalid, wretched, cramped living conditions. They endured backbreaking menial labor. But you know what? In the end, they persevered, they overcame, and they prevailed. Thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs>